heads up. What's more so important? There's some of both of those factors. Yeah, what's going more on. important, do you think? Would you rather have the person get eliminated and receive the pay jump? Or not see the it good player. It depends on the get place tricks. you're in. I think if you're if you're in last, you're sweating the pay jump, and if you're you know, in third or fourth. So you're saying if we're uh, if we're Zach Grun here, Zach Grunberg, we don't mind seeing the double up so much. Yeah, Zach Grunberg actually kind of like the short stacks doubling because the more all of the short stacks are kind of even with each other, the more pressure he can apply. You know, if the stacks start to consolidate a little bit, he sort of loses his big stack edge. Definitely. Zach makes the call. Sheriff of Ace Jack. Action on Justin. Zach just with the call. And Justin Zach in the big blind will come along as well. Justin makes the call. Three players to the front. Drop is the six of spades, eight of spades, the four of spades. So Eric with the nut flush draw back with a mediocre overpair. And Justin with top pair. Eric bets out 210, Small bet from Eric. We've seen this a few times. It does put your opponents in a very tough spot. You don't want to raise a Zach here, but calling it a small bet does seem kind of frustrating. Get, everyone gets to see turn cards for very cheap. Well, it looks like he's carving yeah, he out. Yeah, it, is, it does put Zach in a bit of a tough spot. I think I think that this Zach raise is going to raise. I think that this raise makes sense um, because when you're facing such a small bet, I mean, there's a point at which you can almost disregard the fact that your opponent bet. You know, if he bets one twentieth the size of the pot, it's almost like a check. Yeah. Yeah, and getting heads up has a lot of value, but unfortunately for him, Eric has a hand that he can pretty easily just go over the top with here if he wants to. Well, and he doesn't. See if he, he does. Just makes a call. Well, that's better for Zach. Return card five of diamonds. Return card and offsuit five. Now Eric. We're make it a little harder for Zach to uh, reach showdown here. All right, Eric is contemplating well, a lead here. here. I like, like it actually. I think I think it's a pretty sweet lead. It looks like he has about a pot-sized bet left, but he checks. Zach checks as well, river card. Check, check, river turn, river, river five. Clean run out for Zach. Zach's still with the winner. So now we'll see if Eric manages to uh, turn this into a bluff. If he does, it may work for him. He's just going to bet like 500k here, I feel like. Maybe not. We saw him take showdown with Ace High before, yeah. Well, he does check. Is this it? If you're Zach, you just you just take the showdown and try to win? Yeah, pretty happy to just check here as Zach for sure. No merit going for some value against someone like Eric, especially who we know bets a lot of one pair hands. Well, he's going for value here. Seems a bit uh, optimistic, but it probably won't wind up hurting him here. A little bit ambitious, 900,000 chip bet from Zach. Although, don't put it by Eric to to go all in here. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're more likely to induce a bluff from Eric than a call. So if Zach plans on calling a bluff, then this might work out for him. Otherwise, uh, it could get ugly. I think that this, this pot is over here. So you hear the clock expire before Eric throws in the chip. Uh, that will automatically force Eric to put one of those time chips in. Um, when you have chips available, if the clock expires, you're just automatically forced to use one. You don't forfeit the hand or anything like that. Um, the only time you are forced to make an action is when you're actually out of time chips. Uh, if there's no bet, you're forced to then check. If you are facing a bet, you would be forced to fold. Um, but since Eric has time chips left, he simply is required to forfeit one. So Eric is, is talking out loud here. It looks like he's been contemplating a call rather than yeah, a Usually raise. when you start talking, you're, you take raise out of the equation. Zach can win that one. I'd be pretty happy to win a decent sized pot with that hand. Zach adding to his chip lead.
has about 17 million chips. We are down to five players here at the Borgata Winter Open 2018. The Borgata Hotel, Casino, and Spa. I'm Kane Callis alongside Mike Gagliano. We are here and we are joined by Brian Paris from Holland. This tournament started with 1,244 entries. Not unique entries, because it's a re-entry tournament. How many uh, buy-ins did Joe say he was in for? Joe, I believe, was in for six. Six buy-ins. So some players six. in for, for yes, many, many buy-ins. Uh, I was in for two. Very colorful about that on his bio sheet. Going hard. Certainly has paid off for him. Get a glimpse of that WPT Champions Trophy in the background sitting behind Joe. All the winners of World Poker Tour events get their name engraved on there. Quick fault from Joe. Joe once again running into an ace king behind him. Yeah, and again, we're seeing him uh, willing to just quickly get away from these hands where he's kind of weak and you know, just trying to steal the blinds. People push back against him. He's not really looking to get too involved. You hear the players discussing a hand that took place yesterday that Zach, who, who was the pot against? Were you, were you there for that game? Um, it was against uh, Shane, I believe. Was it? Let's check. How's that? <laughs> uh, either way, on a queen seven three board, Zach got an ace queen versus pocket threes and ran out queen queen to make quads for a very large pot. For his wow. tournament. That, I believe, was for his tournament. And that's kind of what propelled him up, started, started the climb up the leaderboard. It was quite the hand the room erupted. Yeah, that sounds like a great way to get a lot of chips. Yeah, it was against Chase, Chase Bianchi. Chase, yeah. Yeah. It was with about 15 players left in the tournament, 16 players left. That is a uh, soul-crushing way to bust yep. a tournament with yep, 16 players was, left. Yep, and it was for all of Zach's chips. That is not a lot of equity on the flop. Uh, Chase was the chip leader going into day four. But he got a couple of uh, very, very unfortunate runouts. Oh, that being one of them, yeah. And you never get to rest in poker tournaments until it's over, no matter how big your lead is. And well, we saw big. we saw Joe have you know flop the nuts, not win the pot. Chase flops a you know extremely high percentage hand, not win the pot. It does happen. Justin heads up against Michael here. Justin flopping top pair. Michael thinking, though, that his nines are in good shape on this board. Yeah, pretty safe board for two nines. You know, this is one of the better boards that you can hope for here. Only one over card. It's a pretty blank board. Very small bet from Justin, though. Yeah, a little bit less than one-fourth the size of the pot. Yeah, we'll certainly be seeing a turn here. Turn 
Or is a king gives Justin two pair. It's actually a bad card for him because it will make it less likely that he gets action. Even though it technically improves his hand. Well, it's definitely bad when Michael has two nines here. King is a, is a card you would expect Justin to keep barreling some, though, so... We could well, see Michael and, and get stubborn are, in this spot. Lots, but... uh, lots of draws that uh, Justin could possibly have on this board with the hearts out there, the diamonds, but Michael quickly pitches. Justin takes it down. Yeah, good fold by Michael. If you do want to get stubborn there, it's better to choose a hand with a few more outs than just a pair of nines and just drawing the two outs, even if you are uh, if you are behind, you're drawing the two outs. And if you're ahead, your opponent likely has a whole pile of outs, so it's a pretty tough spot to continue at a final table. There is still a ton of separation between Zach's chip stack and the chip stack of anybody else at this final table. Eric is Especially after Joe the losing stack. that big pot. I think they would have been pretty close if, if Joe had held there, but... Zach, unquestioned chip leader here. Justin will open again. Slightly improving his hand. We're seeing Justin uh, open up a little bit here. I mean, it's pretty standard raise from this position. Well, we saw Eric just flat this hand out of the big blind. We're going to see him flat his button now with ace-queen off. Doesn't seem like he likes the reading ace-queen. Likes those low offsuit cards. Joe comes along. Three players. Joe makes the call. Three players to the front. And Joe with top pair and a flush draw. Oh, everybody this kind of likes no this flop, though. You can't hate this as Justin's second nut flush draw. Eric still with ace queen, third nut flush draw. To the three of them, they're working on a straight flush. Eric makes the call. Yeah, Eric's does, actually in pretty bad shape here. Is his, yeah, uh, does does Joe just call, or is there any chance Joe raises here? I would I would be calling. I think he'll just call. Joe calls as well. Knowing the way Joe's been playing this final table, I don't think yeah. he's, even if he thinks he has the edge here, he's just going to try to see more cards and kind of let things develop, get more information before he makes a big commitment to the pot. Now, if you're Eric here, do you check? Wow. Wow. Eric announces Eric all, all in, in with the worst hand, and Joe going to fold million. quickly. It looks like it might win for him. And power poker by Eric pays off. He takes it down. I, I don't know, guys. I think if I were in Eric's shoes there with Joe calling behind, I, I probably would have just checked the turn. I'm kind of surprised to see yeah, Joe fold as fast as he did. I mean, I'm not saying he should have called, but I would have given it a little bit of thought. I mean, you have Eric shoving about pot, and eight, the ace of clubs is a straight end flush draw on that board. I could definitely see Eric making a lot of moves there, which is some, you know, over cards with the flush draw. Do you think that having Zaki behind is a consideration? Mm, it is, but at the same time, I think, you know, we probably would have seen him continue three ways if he had any sort of hand. I mean, basically any hand except for the stone nuts does not like being three ways on a board like that. If you've got a set, if you've got a middle flush, whatever it is, you don't want to give free cards. So um, I think most of his good hands just do bet. So when he checks, he's probably giving up most of the time. Well, Eric has certainly been uh, playing the most creatively at this final table. The 48-year-old from Montreal, he is the oldest player at this final table. 
He's playing fearless and it's working out for him in a lot of these spots. Sometimes it hasn't. When he tried to bluff raise Joe on the river, that did not work out very well. But the rest of his hands have mostly been working in his favor. Eric is the only non-professional poker player at this final table. He's involved in real estate. Yeah, it's got an asterisk, though. This is his fifth World Poker Tour I was final table, say, which is very he's impressive. Second most winning player at this final table. So both players pair here. That's the better pair. Again, we see Eric continuing anytime he kind of, you know, improves his hand any bit. This is a board he does want to bet to uh, protect, like even even though he's not really going to get a whole lot of action from worse hands necessarily. Um, it's it's a spot where there's a lot of overcards to his pair. So while his hand is pretty good right now, he can't really afford to give a free card. Unfortunately, Jimmy is running the top pair of Justin Zaki. Do you ever consider raising here if you're uh, if you're Justin? Oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, this hand, this hand is very strong. I'm actually kind of surprised he didn't. I think especially against a player like Eric, who's been you know making a few plays, makes a, making a few floats as well. I think that that may have had a little bit of merit behind it. Well, uh, Eric has also been Eric is also prone to you know running some sort of big bluff too. So maybe Justin's just trying to trap him here. Yeah, maybe. I think both options have merit, but I, I am a bit surprised to not see a raise there. I guess the other factor is that Justin's been playing pretty tight, pretty in line. So if he were to check raise this flop, it would probably get more respect than maybe if one of the other players were to check raise here. King of Hearts. So Justin's good top pair is sort of turned into a bluff catcher now. It's going to be kind of hard for him to get too much value. Except maybe from worse jacks. I, I'd like see to see it. Yeah, I'd like bluff. to see a bet. Yeah, I, I would have bet. I would have bet that river if I were Justin. I mean, if you're if, Justin or if you're if you're Justin. If I'm Justin, uh, there are a lot okay. of hands that I check call the flop that that don't really uh, that aren't in very good shape on the on the river. Up, uh, I mean, know, five six, uh, five eight, eight six, um, eight nine, eight ten. All these gut shot kind of hands on the flop. That I'm just check calling. Especially if we've seen Eric, you know, kind of bet a lot of his different pairs. He's gonna have a lot more sevens and fours than other people. Uh, he he wanted to call uh, uh, Joe earlier. Or no, sorry, Zach earlier when he only had ace high. Um, you know, he really thought that went over. So if he's got some hero calls in him, I, I really think that like the best top best flop top pair is an easy an easy bet on that river. Folks. Folks as well. Over to Joe on the button with Jack Nine offsuit. Not a great hand, but certainly good enough when it folds to you on the button. Joe raises makes it two hundred and sixty thousand. Justin folds the small blind action on the Mike just calling Michael with Brown. King Jack of Hearts. Do you know how deep uh, Michael's stack is here? Like 40 big blinds, I guess? I believe, yeah, I believe about 37, something like that. Now, very interesting flop. Both players up and down. Joe with a flush draw. Interesting card. Michael now with top pair up and down, and Joe makes a straight. Mike making top pair. Little does he know that that is the worst card in the deck as he can no longer win this pot. He can only chop it or lose it.
And he is out of position. He's going to have to play another street on the river, and he does not really have... I mean, he, he does have a straight draw, but not having a diamond in your hand does make it a lot harder to uh, navigate this sort of spot out of position, and it'll be interesting to see what he does here. Any chance he can just fold here? This is a I close spot. I, I would be calling. Yeah, when you can see the cards, you know? Could definitely yeah, see it being easy on Joe to put pressure on if he just had the ace of diamonds. Yeah, Joe definitely capable of running a big bluff here with something with a hand containing just the ace of diamonds, for example. Joe gonna bet. Looks like just about a million. Joe bets out one million fifty thousand. The issue with with Michael's hand on the turn is that against Joe's bluffs, you still you you ha you're ahead, but you don't have like amazing equity against hands like the ones that Joe has. Your equity is just really bad. Zero. I mean, in, right. in this case, it's zero. Still a top of her spot. Definitely possible for Joe to it have is. some bluffs here. And you've a relatively yeah, you block some of the some of the straight combos with your yeah, jack. You have a relatively you, uh... good hand to call with here. I mean. He's going to get here with a lot of, like, you know, queen jack, queen nine type hands here. Other hands that have a diamond, you know, perhaps a ten with a diamond or something like that. This king jack feels pretty good here on the river. But Joe just has so many value combos as part of the problem. I mean, he can have any diamonds. He can have jack nine. He can have ace jack. He'd be doing this with sets. Right, how many Yeah, Joe's going to be opening the button with a lot of different suited hands, too, because he's going to be opening the button pretty wide in this spot. See so he Joe can have all sorts of just, like, random diamond combos here. Joe with the stare down. Tough spot for Mike. Joe's got a great stare down. Mike nice makes it over, down. makes a fold. Very nice fold by Mike. Good fold by Michael there. And I, I think I think that makes sense. Joe also has uh, two pairs you could be betting there. It, it's like the ace, ace of diamonds X is one of the few bluff hands I can see Joe showing up with in that spot. Yeah, agreed. I've got an interesting stat for you guys. Michael Martyr is actually second in the all-time cash list for here at the Borgata. He has 74 caches here at the Borgata. Second wow. to only Howard Walper, who has 103 caches here. Have you ever met Howard? Those are some high I have numbers. played with him several times, yes. Yeah, I think I played with him out in Vegas at least once. He looks familiar. So new chip counts here. Zach with still the commanding lead, Joe with about half of his chips, and then a few 30 big blind stacks bringing up the rear. Plenty of poker left to be played. We are uh, nowhere near finishing this one. Justin raises, makes it 260,000. Michael Holtz. I'm going to take that one down with the King Jack offsuit. Even the blinds and antis are a pretty nice pickup. Yeah, they are starting to get large here. I think they'll be going up again in a few minutes here. One hour clock for each level at this point. Here the tournament director saying five minutes remaining. Michael 
Michael with Jack 10 student on the button, a nice holding. Here comes Eric again. Eric not shy about three minutes with a trashy hand. Michael with a pretty playable one here, though. Different He's kind of hand for, for Eric here. Yeah, we haven't seen him play with too many of these ragged high card hands. I actually prefer the play with the low card hands. At least those can make straights, flop straight draws. You know, a hand like King 3, whenever you get called pre-flop, you're just always going to be in these really ugly spots with basically no equity out of position. And we'll see if this ends well for him. Well, might that turn might help may help his case a little bit. Maybe. The problem for him is a lot of Michael's floats are going to hit this turn as well. King Jack, he does block King Jack, but Michael can have uh, Ace Jack. I guess he can't really have Ace King. He probably four bets that. He uh, Mike actually limped this hand, and then Eric isoed. Is what uh, okay, happened. Okay. It was not a not a three bet. I thought it was a three bet. Michael pulled. Well, Eric's aggression pays yeah, off. Yeah, the aggression pays off once again. We really have seen that aggression work out well for him. I think that that's, that's something that said for just it's going to work you know, when there's five players, but I think the shorter handed they get and the more willing people are to kind of battle with him, I think it's going to be a lot tougher for him to make those plays work. Yeah, I agreed. So it'll be interesting to see if he if he finds a, you know, the, a comfort zone where he slows down a little bit and is able to kind of control that aggression. Well, raw aggression works surprisingly well at final tables just because of, you know, the nature of the pay jumps and everything. Of course. So putting people in, you know, tough small in spots is going to work more often than it has any right to. We're seeing that here. Joe with Ace Jack suited in the big blind. Up against the small blind limp of Zach. Ace Jack suited a fantastic hand for this spot. We are going to see Joe put a raise in. Nice oh, shows it was a little interesting. I think this is kind of going with that other. theme of Joe being pretty honest for the most part. This final table. There's also some value to him just to signal to the chip leader, like, look, I'm not really messing with you. Like, if I enter a pot against you, I probably have it. Like, even if it's true, it does actually benefit him somewhat to have Zach not really be trying to play back at him and, like, put him in tough spots. This will be the last hand before these players take a small break. Oh, it was interesting to see if the break dynamic comes into play in some hands. I've seen some large pots go down at various points in tournaments that I don't think would have happened if it weren't for the break coming up. Some players are that's itching. That's definitely to... true. I think that's probably a little bit less at a final table. I think you know, so, like too, yeah. To get to the bathroom or get to dinner. But the final table is important enough. I don't think people are going to change their uh, strategies too much. Go with king two in the small blind. Okay. 
was waiting for was he waiting for the clock to go I, off I, he... I wonder I, I don't uh, yeah he was yeah okay that's, what, that's I mean I, I assume he uh, had no intention of playing the hand I just didn't know if he didn't see the raise or if he had some sort of other thing I don't on. see how they would have gotten another hand out anyway so I was a little surprised to see him do that but just making sure So we saw Joe McKeon float the flop with a hand like this out of position earlier. Do you think that uh, Justin may have similar ideas of Zach Betts? I think it's a pretty reasonable spot to float. He's got overs to the nine. He has backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw, and it's a spot where Zach's range is going to be very, very wide. So that seems like a pretty reasonable spot for him to float. The only thing that might slow him down is... Uh, his stack position relative to Zach's is kind of hard for him to want to play too many, you know, tough spots out of position against the big stack here. Well, he doesn't float. Zach takes it down, adding to his chip lead, and these players are going on break. So, so are we. This is Kane Callis again alongside Mike Agliano and Brian Paris, and we'll see you back uh, pretty soon after 15, 15, minutes. 15 minutes after this player's break. Eric with a boat. Yeah. A one outer boat at that. Yeah, Steven can get in a lot of trouble in this spot here. I mean, if, if Eric raises here, I don't think we're going to see anything but Steven shoving here. Well, it looks like he does raise. Just a min raise to 350,000. And this is the problem with playing a limp strategy like Steven has done here is when you do limp and you let the small blind and the big blind in on any paired board like this, there's a lot of tens out there. Now, uh, I would, uh, against a min raise here, I would just be flatting. Um, but Steven does go all in. He'll get the bad news. and He has about 1% equity in the pot. Running tens or running aces. Or I guess he is a running five, straight flush spot, four yeah. five of final hearts. Table. That's not going to do six, it. Very unfortunate do for Steven because if Eric had a 10, then he would still be fairly live. He'd have at least like 25% or whatever. But against the main full house, he is close to dead on the flop. Uh, they're going to count the, the chips because they're pretty close in in stack here. But I, I believe that Steven's going to be our sixth place finisher. That Eric does have him covered by a few. Uh, that's a brutal way to go out after being chip leader for uh, you know most of the down the stretch, but like you said, things can change very quickly in poker tournaments. Joe saying that he covers, I tend to believe Joe here. Stephen Sung is our sixth place finisher here today, and he goes home with a hundred thirty-eight thousand two hundred and fifty-four dollars for. We're gonna have a deep stack event and a World Poker Tour main event. So Ooh. if you guys are anywhere near Europe at that time, make sure you check that out. So speaking of the limping ep uh, epidemic at this table, we got Michael limping, Eric limping. Over to Zach in the small blinds. I think this is a, like a microcosm of the way poker works. People see players do something and they want to try it. They s maybe assume it's good and they want to be like the other good players. I wonder how many guys like really came into today like saying, hey, I'm going to limp a lot versus, oh, that's a good idea. Let me try that. Well, so far we've yeah, seen... Yeah, that's an interesting point. We've seen every player at this table open limp except for Joe and Justin. Yeah, Justin just hasn't played an incredible amount of pots so far. I would guess Joe's not going to limp unless it's blind versus blind or heads up. Yeah, agreed. I'd, I think I'd Joe has a pretty good I'd, idea of what he's doing. I'd be willing to bet that Justin is not going to limp either. Hold on a second, guys. Uh, this is a quite the hands here. Wow. Mike has flopped <laughs> the set of threes. Eric is top pair, but Joe has flopped the nut straight. There's going to be, be a big action. one here. This could be the biggest pot of the tournament so far. Well, Joe raises it up to 950, and now Michael, there's no way that he's going 
going to be able to get away from his yeah, set here. He goes all in. Here. Joe calls. Mike gets the bad news, but he, he does have 35% equity here. Mike will need the board to pair. Otherwise, he will be our fifth place finisher. Third card's a queen, no help for Mike. He's going to need a queen, a four, a three, or a deuce going to the river. The river card is a queen, and Mike hits a full house. Well, that jersey working out so far. Mike makes a full <laughs> house be wishing he'd more than double up. A yeah, nice hand for Mike there. A very uh, important, necessary double up for Michael Martyr there. And unfortunate for Joe McKeon, who's just kind of steadily been chipping up at the. But he got a couple of uh, very, very unfortunate runouts. Oh, that being one of them, yeah. And you never get to rest in poker tournaments until it's over, no matter how big your lead is. And almost well, we saw we saw Joe have you know flop the nuts, not win the pot. Chase flops a you know extremely high percentage hand, not win the pot. It does happen. Justin heads up against Michael here. Justin flopping top pair. Michael thinking though that. His nines are in good shape on this board. Yeah, pretty safe board for two nines. You know, this is one of the better boards that you can hope for here. Only one over card. It's a pretty blank board. Very small bet from Justin, though. Yeah, a little bit less than one-fourth the size of the pot. And yeah, we'll certainly be seeing a turn here. Turn is a king gives Justin two pair. It's actually a bad card for him because it will make it less likely that he gets action, even though it technically improves his hand. Well, it's definitely bad when Michael has two nines here. King is a, is a card you would expect Justin to keep barreling some, though, so... We could well, see Michael get stubborn are, in this spot. There are lots, spot, of, uh, lots of draws that uh, Justin could possibly have on this board with the hearts out there, the diamonds, but Michael quickly pitches. Justin takes it down. Yeah, good fold by Michael. If you do want to get stubborn there, it's better to choose a hand with a few more outs than just a pair. Justin will open again. Slightly improving his hand. We're seeing Justin uh, open up a little bit here. I mean, it's pretty standard raise from this position. Well, we saw Eric just flat this hand out of the big blind. We're going to see him flat his button now with ace-queen off. Doesn't seem like he likes the reading ace-queen. Likes those low offsuit cards. Joe comes along. Three players. Joe makes the call. Three players for the flat. And Joe with top pair and a flush draw. Oh, everybody kind of likes no this flop, though. You can't hate this as Justin's second nut flush draw. Eric still with ace queen, third nut flush draw. To the three of them, they're working on a straight flush. Yeah, Eric's actually in pretty bad shape here. Is his, yeah, uh, does does Joe just call, or is there any chance Joe raises here? I would I would be calling. I think he'll just call. Knowing the way Joe's been playing this final table, I don't think yeah. he's, even if he thinks he has the edge here, he's just going to try to see more cards and kind of let things develop, get more information before he makes a big commitment to the pot. Now, if you're Eric here, do you check? Wow. Wow. 
Eric announces Eric all in with in the worst hand, and Joe going to fold million. quickly. It looks like it might win for him. And power poker by Eric pays off. He takes it down. I, I don't know, guys. I think if I were in Eric's shoes there with Joe calling by. It looks like we are back, folks. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Five players remain. We're back here at the Borgata Hotel, Casino, and Spa. Down to five players in the Borgata Winter Poker Open main event. It started with uh, Zach Grunberg in the chip lead, and he has remained the chip leader throughout this final table. We lost Steven Song in sixth place, and... There are five players remaining. I'm Kane Callis alongside Mike Egliano, Brian Paris joining us all the way from Amsterdam. I got to say, we only lost one player in those first two levels, but it was a pretty explosive first two levels. A lot of back and forth. Eric involved in a lot of pots. We saw Mike with that double up, getting it in. Good hand, but quite behind Joe's straight, getting there on the river. A lot of action. Definitely a fairly exciting first two levels, despite the lack of bust outs. But now that the blinds are up, we will probably see a lot more bust outs in these next two levels. Blinds up to 75,000 and 150,000. Justin in a small blind here against Eric's cutoff. Eric will take it down. You see that the blue 5,000 chips have been removed from play. That's why we're not playing 81.60. And a new chip has been introduced. The brown chips that are worth, I believe those are worth 250,000. Justin, 5.9, and then Mike, 3.05. Well, Michael with 19 big blinds, Zach with 112, and the other three stacks kind of in the middle. You hear some... Bit of commotion over the new chips that were brought out. The 250,000 chips are not liked by the players. A Kessler-esque objection there from the players here. Zach saying he doesn't know how to raise. He also doesn't know how to put both of his cards in the <laughs> card viewer, apparently. Well, we know he has a jack, so that uh, his upper bound is jacks, and his lower bound is jack two offsets. Well, so somewhere between those. Justin and Joe both folded a jack. Well, I assume Justin's going to fold here, but... Those are kind of camouflage chips, aren't they? I don't think it's the color the players are necessarily objecting to. I think it's the denomination. Um, the 5,000s are just in play. You know, the 25,000s are on the table along with the 100,000s. The next logical jump is traditionally the 500,000 chip. So 250 is a bit of a weird, a bit of a weird denomination. But Michael moving all in. I'll hold that thought. 250 definitely not a size you see too often. Back over to Jack with or Zach with presumably not a pair of jacks in his hand. Uh, would does he have? Uh, does he have ace jack? I guess is his hand. If he's actually thinking uh, maybe King Jack suited something like that. I think King Jack suited would be the bottom of his uh, tanking range. <laughs> so tough decision for Zach. Although we don't know his his cards. Now, do you call with King Jack suited? I, I think I don't think he would call with. King. I think he would. Probably just eventually fold King Jack here. Yeah, agreed. I think I think it's a hand that you like maybe think about it, figure out the numbers, and then wind up folding. I, I think Ace Jack. I think it's Ace Jack. I think that that's the one that feels really close. That 
he's not sure of. And he will let it go. We'll never know. You hear Zach mention he can't wait to see it on the live stream. Interesting, Zach, since we didn't know your cards on that one. Once again, you're watching the Borgata WPT Winter Poker Open final table here. The Borgata Casino Hotel and Spa. You see Joe playing with uh, Zach's chips there as he's trying to get rid of these 250 thousands. I believe they are bringing out the 500 thousand chips. So give the tournament staff a moment while they swap out the chips. That seems like a fairly minor uh, point of contention, but it is actually kind of important if you're not used to seeing 250s, you know, you start to count them as 500s, you could easily make a pretty big calculation error it's in a high leverage. Yeah, state. it'd be very easy to drop in the wrong chips. So I don't see what the difference is, guys, between uh, going from having 5Ks and 1Ks to then introducing 25Ks to... Yeah, on a logical level, that makes sense, but for some reason you just don't see 250 in tournament. At least not in my experience. It gets awkward because... It gets awkward because I think the, the traditional is one one five twenty five is the way you see a lot of things go. You, you go 100, or so you go 1,000, 5,000, 25,000. But then you go 100,000 and where do you go from there? Everyone wants a million chip also because no one wants to play with like a 2.5 million chip. It's the same thing with the 1,000 chip. Um, the 1,000 chip is in play because no one wants to play with a 2.5, you know, 2,500 chip. So for those numbers to hit the 1,000, to hit the 1 million, you have to kind of do a double. You go, you like, you play 100, 500, 1,000. You play with those chips. Uh, you do the same thing at 100,000. You play 100,000, 500,000, a million. So that's the, the difference. That's what people are used to. And that's why the 250,000 is weird. Um, it's the same reason that the you know 2.5,000 chip does not exist. It's easier to have a 250 because there's no decimal, but it's still just as awkward for the players. Is Zach just calling here with queens, it looks like. Yeah, and I think that this is, Joe's under the gun. This is again, going to get back to the big stacks, you know, does not want, not wanting to play against each other here. Zach does not seem to want to play a 14 million chip pot against Joe. I think it makes sense. I mean, especially when you're a big blind versus under the gun, a three bet from you would look just tremendously strong. So rather than doing that, you're just going to kind of disguise your whole range by flatting with your strong hands as well. Not the flop Zach dreamed up here. Well, not great, but he'll definitely be calling at least one with this sizing, I think. It's also not a board that Joe's really going to be multi-barreling super off. Turn in, eight of spades. 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 Turn doesn't change anything. I expect we'll see check check a lot on the river. Zach can play a lot of his ace axes this way. There's not a whole lot of reason for him to have to bet with most of his middling ace axes on the river. So he yeah, can, when he checks when the, the river, flush he does have a good deal of ace axes left in his range. Oh, I guess I am. You are going to be mistaken here. Apparently, I don't. I don't know what this bet is correct. To I guess. To be honest with you. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a very small bet. Uh, sometimes you see that bet from players who want to avoid a tough situation on the river if they check. So although the bet may not make, you know, may not merit the the, the, the best results, uh, it, it helps them to prevent facing those tough decisions. So uh, there's something that can be said for that, I suppose. I think, I think uh, that argument probably holds more merit against players who are worse than Joe. Yeah, I, I would think so too. 
I don't think that's a bet you're probably going to get away with at this funnel table versus most players. These players are generally too experienced. So those new brown chips are worth 500,000 now that we've swapped out the 250s. All Joe had to do was ask, apparently. Yeah, I don't blame him. No, I don't either. I don't either. It's definitely awkward, and I would hate to, you know, accidentally put in the wrong chip at this stage of the tournament. Yeah, I mean, when you're playing for this much money, cer certainly requests like that are very reasonable and can definitely be accommodated. Some discussion in the YouTube chat about the uh, those plaques that are used in a lot of uh, European casinos that are starting to make their way over here in the U.S. in some places. Uh, have you played with any of those, Brian? Yeah, they have them here at Holland Casino. Anything 1K and up, they have like plaques instead of chips. Do you like those better? Eh, I, I, I'd rather just have chips. Just easier to easier to stack, and you're just used to them. Yeah, I'm more used to chips. I mean, I guess plaques, like, you're a little bit less likely to lose them than chips, maybe, but I, I don't know what other argument there is in favor. Plaques, for those that don't know, are those larger, generally square, or sorry, generally rectangular, um, you know, chip-like things that are called plaques that are used instead of uh, the round, well, traditional the, round. The things. other benefit is you could feel like you're in a James Bond movie. That's true. Uh, I That's used, true, yeah. I used plaques this year at the Wynn casino in las vegas they switched all their 5ks over to plaques so when i was playing big plo out there um i used a lot of those Eric's gonna bet tough spot for zach versus the small bet especially versus from eric you're gonna have to at least put in 450 here and see a river card i'm surprised uh, that zach check the turn I, I would have been betting this turn yeah i think either play is okay you, you do get some value from eric but eric does not have a tremendous amount of chips so he may think that eric's gonna be a little more careful and might think he doesn't have that value where if you know eric was deeper he'd put more money in with a five or a four maybe having jacks as one of your check calls on the turn is kind of nice too because it's just less likely that overcards hit versus having something like pocket eights or a nine Eric, shows king of Eric will check the river and win there with the king-queen. Big pot for Eric. 